Hello, Redis Conf. I'm Matteo Collina, and I'm here to talk to you today about uh, auto pipelining and maybe a little bit of theory behind head of line blocking. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. I am Matteo, I'm technical director at Nearform. You can follow me on Twitter at Matteo Collina. Uh, I uh, am usually uh, active in the uh, Node.js uh, in the Node.js community, and um, uh, I spoke at NodeConfU and a lot of other things. Uh, I'm mainly a Node.js developer. I'm also part of the Node.js Technical Steering Committee, which is the group that has the technical leadership of the Node.js project. Anyway, uh, I even spoke too much about me, so uh, let's get into it and start. Oh, one more thing. I am really active on NPM. I get more or less uh, 6 billion downloads. My software is downloaded 6 billion times per year on NPM, which is probably a lot, but I don't know, maybe. A um, uh, couple of things about Nearform. Uh, we, the company started in 2011. We did a huge bet on on Node.js, and we are now at 170 people over 20 over 20 countries. Um, we do uh, we are a consultancy company. We provide support in the design and uh, uh, development and then deployment of um, world class software solutions. Uh, my role there is probably mainly focusing on the scalability part and per scalability and performance part of those platforms. And as said, we use Node.js for our backend. So um, let's get uh, let's get started in a little bit more uh, detail. So first of all, um, a few um, years back, I was, uh, or maybe even now, for a lot, a lot of ways, um, I uh, I was working on a microservice system. Which had, uh, you know, I had the client, then the talk via the cloud to a, node, a gateway written in Node.js. This is essentially a coordination orchestrator pattern that talked to a lot of microservices. Um, and this was uh, uh, again, this project was in uh, uh, was done around 2019, I think, um, at the beginning, uh, but. Uh, to be honest, it can even be worthwhile now, and in fact, use similar knowledge even you know last week. Um, in this case, we had a very dynamic and complex uh, uh, usage pattern, and where we had uh, you know um, the processing on the microservices was very CPU intensive and very data intensive. But on the other end, we needed to provide really. Um, uh, fast response even uh, even really fast response all the time so we cannot we were not allowed to go down and uh, um, uh, but it was allowed for, but graceful degradation was possible so essentially if some part of the system was not available or under massive load we could uh, essentially degrade gracefully the service to our user but, but it was important that we still replied uh, there could also be massive and unexpected traffic spikes. So you see, it's a, it's a complex use case. And, uh, um, you know, uh, so in order to implement those things, we started thinking a lot of what, how could we address those, uh, uh, those exceptions. Um, well, one of the key techniques is to implement a circuit breaker. Circuit breaking is, uh, circuit breakers are a very, very, Common pattern around the industry, and it's something that uh, we, you know, we we deploy and we recommend using all the time. Um, so, in 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 a circuit breaking world, our server, our gateway, more 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 importantly, can be in various state. Most important one is closed. So, if the circuit is closed, requests are flowing. So, um, and then we can actually uh, go very fast and uh, uh, use all the capabilities of the system. Uh, however, uh, if one of the microservices went started to go down, like this was the success, right? And case. But then we could start seeing some failures. 
like we were deploying in our architecture, we were deploying one of those circuit breakers for each of the microservices. So we started flowing, like if we had some failure in one of the microservices, um, uh, under a given threshold, we were accepting those failures, and uh, that was fine. Um, however, we then, if there was uh, uh, the ratio of failures was over that threshold, we went, we moved to a uh, uh, open uh, circuit. The circuit will open, and these requests were not flowing, are not flowing to the microservice, and you know this is uh, uh, stays here. And um, but typically stays here. It's uh, after until a timeout, and after a timeout, it goes into half open state, which it does another call. So it tries to let a request pass. If a request pass, oh, everything is fine now. So we go back to success mode. If it fails, it goes back to open and stays there for another timeout. This is really, really important because we could use this pattern to uh, implement our gateway. And uh, for each one of the microservices we we're talking to, uh, and uh, um, we could use, uh, we started to use Redis to cache um, the uh, the partial results for those microservices and those calls. So we could assume a, case, um, a caching strategy where, uh, when we're calling a microservice, we could then cache that data, and uh, then return that data if. Um, uh, returns that the, that the cache data even if the circuit breaker uh, uh, open opened up this was was it was a really good intuition because in this way we were just like okay we can do a lot of um, if one of the microservices goes down it uh, 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 it was really you know we started serving data directly from the cache from Redis so not a big problem right why it should be well, it didn't work. We were not able to meet the traffic spikes that we had. In fact, we did not get, like we had some improvement, but not significantly. It did not work as we expected it to. How? Why? Uh, this was one of the most puzzling, puzzling things that, you know, it was, it was going through us. Well, let's go a little bit on the theory. So let's talk about head of line blocking. Head of line blocking is one, you know, if you're talking about a Node.js server, a Node.js server uh, could uh, do more than one request, uh, um, can implement, support more than one request per second uh, at, at, at any given time, right? It's, uh, you know, it is this uh, event loop based software like Redis, like Nginx and a lot of others, so it can receive more than requests and handle them in parallel. Now, one request comes in and you see it here, comes in. And then the Node.js server send it to Redis and then send it back and we get the result back. And this is totally fine. What happens is if, like, we have one single connection to Redis right here. And we can even have 10, doesn't change at all the problem. It just lowers it, change a little bit the math, but it doesn't change it. So um, Now, the problem is that if we receive a second HTTP request that still needs to access Redis uh, before... It's uh, uh, before the previous uh, call to Redis is done, you see that it will get queued up. Okay? And uh, uh, you see that we are get, we can send the second result only after the first, but the, the, the gap is, is widening. As you can see, there is an additional delay being introduced by head of line blocking in the end response. So in reality, we are going to a lot of, uh, there is a lot of queuing happening. At, uh, on this front, because all these commands need to be sent one by one on our socket. So how can we solve this? How can we improve this problem? Well, um, Redis has a feature called pipelining. And with pipelining, uh, you can uh, actually send multiple commands over the same, uh, uh, um, send multiple commands before receiving the result. So essentially, uh, multiplying the your throup the throughput of your system. You can reading more about it at Redis.io topics slash pipelining. It's very common. So how do we use pipeline in in uh, in Node? Well, in Node.js is actually very easy. You get your Redis client, you instantiate your Redis client, and then you call pipeline, and then you do your your commands, and then you exec the pipeline. Good. 
what does it mean in in reality? Well, it means that um, uh, we can use pipeline. What we want to use is that instead of uh, waiting for those two things to, uh, so the, the the two incoming requests, we want them to pipeline them and put them in the same pipeline so that we can actually respond to them at the same time without having that additional delay. In this way, we can maximize the use of Redis and minimize our latency and also maximize application throughput. So this is really, really uh, nice. Now, this is mostly a problem for Node.js because a Node.js server can easily take 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 or even uh, requests per second. So uh, concurrent requests. So, you know, you, you want to be able to handle this kind of pattern with Node. Um, you know, you might decide, oh, but I'm just going to use a connection pool. Well, a connection pool is, it's, um, you know, you can't have too many sockets on a system. So in reality, you're talking about affinity resource. So you want, even if you use a connection pool or cluster or whatever, you, you still want something like this under very, very uh, st stressful uh, um, situation for your, for your backend. So uh, how do we uh, um, going to implement this? Well, one of our goals, we wanted to implement this feature without massively changing our source code. And that was one of the key things, one of the key requirements. Now, this was a little bit hard to achieve, so I'm going to talk a little bit about it later. Um, but first of all, let's talk a little bit uh, uh, before about the event loop theory. So uh, in Node.js, when we receive an event, um, so in Node.js, this is your JavaScript running. When we want to do some I/O, we set we configure something either on the kernel async I/O barrier or on the thread pool. And uh, once those trigger, once there is an event, that get put into the event queue. And those things then will are getting pushed back here. Okay. There is even a special thing that we can use to trigger a full round of the event loop called set immediate. Now. Going a little bit deeper in how the event loop work. So uh, when we receive into that circle into that big box, so in that big box, in that big uh, uh, round at the, at the at the in the middle, that is Node.js. So the event loop is running, is receiving events, then it schedules some uh, in, an event to be executed, and in this case, the event loop is, is blocked. So it's not actually executing anything else. This is actually very interesting because uh, this is where we can get some of our throughput in. Uh, note that if we can, for example, intercept all the Redis command that happens between those two things, we can actually speed things up quite a lot. Um, uh, now, another thing that is very important is the event, the, the event loop phases. So in Node.js, when we uh, uh, the event loop is is divided in phases, and uh, the most important one being being poll. So in poll, we process all the incoming events. All the incoming events ac actually ends up executed in poll. We can then, but we can schedule something to happen in timers, for example, if we want a timer. We can uh, help doing like all those these two things, forget about them, really, they are not super useful. But the check is actually very, very important because we can even schedule something inside check with a thing called set immediate. So what we can do inside poll at any given time is we can say, when we have finished processing, processing all the incoming events, go and execute, a, execute something inside this phase. We can do this thing to you know, collect all the incoming comments uh, inside ready that, that we want to send to Redis from all the connections and then send them via check to our client. So uh, this is a very simple example of a Fastify application. Fastify is a web framework for Node.js that I wrote, so you can uh, play with it if you want to. Uh, so in this application, we have we use Fastify Redis to wrap it, and we get the Redis uh, a key from Redis here. Now with this thing, uh, we get uh, on my system. 20, these are dedicated servers, so we get uh, uh, with a hundred connections, we get almost. 24,000 as a median uh, of uh, requests per second. It's pretty fast, right? Do, do we need to get it faster? Well, might be. It, it also depends on how many commands you need to execute and so on and so forth, right? So this application is very trivial. 
Uh, now, I started to, I, then I developed a very small um, implementation of a, um, uh, of a concept called auto pipelining, or in this case, manual pipelining. So the type of change that we needed to do to make pipelining work inside inside Redis, inside my app, was that I basically my handler for my route, what I need to do is get the pipeline, the current pipeline, and then execute my command. When the command is finished, then I can actually send the data. Now, how does this work so getting this pipeline? Well, there is a global pipeline set in here. And if a global pipeline exists, then uh, it's uh, um, uh, if a global pipeline exists, it returns it. Uh, but if it doesn't, then it's, uh, it creates one and it schedules its execution in uh, in the check phase of the event loop. Like if you re if you recall here, you had the uh, the check phase, right? So we schedule it it uh, after to be completed as soon as uh, the event loop. We have received all the incoming events from our system from from the event loop. So the, the, this is nice because uh, we can, um, when we execute the pipeline, we just trigger this execution and then reset it to null. So the result is that whenever we execute the pipeline, we create a fresh one, which is actually, we, we reset it. So the next request or something, we can get a fresh one. It's pretty powerful. The result for this is that we almost doubled our performance. So we moved from, 24,000, well, not doubled, but plus 50% at least, 24,000 to almost to 37,000 request, um, uh, request per second. Notably, we also lowered the, the latency from 8 milliseconds to 7 milliseconds. Pretty nice, right? This is actually something that I'm pretty proud of. And this is just a simple, it's just a simple example of what we can do. Now, you can... The original prototype was done at these repos, so it was called github.com slash mcolina slash iOredis auto, auto pipeline, so you can check that out if you want to. Um, after that, we started, my team and myself, started looking into how we could integrate this inside iOredis itself. So is, this was the pull request, the 1,201 was done by my colleague uh, Paolo Insonia, and uh, it was uh, um, uh, it it was really it's really powerful here. This one was really powerful because it could make it work with cluster, which was not supported before, and it provided uh, even more throughput and latency improvement and a transparent transparent implementation. So we don't have to do anything. You just need to pass a configuration variable, enab enable auto pipelining, and just use your Redis clients as it is as it is. And, uh, you know, it moved from 24,000 to 39,000. Pretty great, right? It, you just flip a configuration value, uh, a config value, and you get more throughput. It's pretty nice. But note that most notably, we move the latency from uh, at uh, the 99th percentile, uh, move from, 80, uh, from 8 milliseconds to uh, 5 milliseconds, which is really, really nice. Okay, I, I really like this. Um, so, if you uh, just want to take to get some takeaways from from this talk, is that you can just enable auto pipelining to increase your throughput by 30, 100 percent, depending on the use case. We did a lot of checks here, and uh, then um, this is also that you can actually leverage the key characteristics of a runtime to uh, allow for some platform specific optimization. This is really nice. Because we will, this same thing is harder to do on other runtimes, uh, but we could do it on other runtimes uh, on, on Node.js because of the nature of its event loop. Um, Note that also Node and Redis are a great combo together, so use more Node, uh, Redis people. Um, yeah, that's my takeaway. So if you want, auto blinding can improve your throughput by 30, 50, 100%. I just want to thank you all and thank the team at ReadingsConf to uh, for having me. Uh, check us out uh, at nearfrom.com uh, and uh, follow me on Twitter at Matteo Collina. Bye! Bye-bye!